In this video, we're going to uh, continue with confidence intervals for proportions by completing a practice problem. So in the previous video, we kind of talked about um, the context here, um, that a proportion is going to be basically a percentage um, in a population, the percentage of responses um, that should have a certain condition. If we think of it just like as a yes, no question, it might be the proportion of yeses in a particular population. So again, we want to um, try to estimate um, on the true proportion within a population based on our results from a particular sample. Um, so uh, we're going to go through this practice problem where this um, context is going to be um, the commonality of the BRCA1 um, gene mutation. Um, so this is a gene that has been linked to breast cancer. And researchers um, use DNA analysis to search for BRCA1 mutations in 169 women who had family histories of breast cancer. These women were deemed to be representative of women in this population. Um, these, these 169 are kind of a representative sample then of the um, women with family histories of breast cancer population. Of the 169 women tested, 27 of them had the mutation. We're interested in estimating the true proportion of women in this population who have this mutation. Okay, so first, before we can make a confidence interval, we have to consider if we have met the necessary assumptions to validly complete a confidence interval in this situation. So remember that we have two um, kind of uh, check marks here that we need to decide if we can give. Um, the first is if the sample that we have is appropriately representative of the population, which we just read that it is, um, which we will commonly do um, in this section kind of moving forward. So we've talked a lot about design, we've talked about sampling and these different things. Um, so, so at this point, we're kind of pushing that aside and trying to focus more on the procedure of, of the statistical method we're using. Um, however, normal, and as we get to the end of the course, we'll kind of bring that back in again and talk about all of these things holistically. But for now, we're just going to be content to say that this is a representative sample and we have kind of met that uh, criteria. The second is the, the normality assumption. So remember, uh, we need the distribution of possible p-hats that we could get here to be normally distributed if we're going to use um, a confidence interval assuming this parametric um, uh, model here. So we haven't really talked about the word parametric or non-parametric, but it just means we have a distributional assumption about the distribution of p-hat. Uh, that p-hat, so, so you know, we have the true population of responses is going to be yeses and nos. It probably looks something like this, where we have a certain amount of yeses, we have a certain amount of nos. So, and this is like, this is like, you know, zero and one, one and zero. Uh, but if you think about it, if I have a distribution of p hats, some of my p hats are going to be around like, say, 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.25. And there's a distribution of possible p hats that I could see um, when I randomly sample um, from this population. And so this is the thing that we need to be normally distributed around whatever P really is, whatever the actual proportion really is. Um, so we can make this assumption if two things are true, um, or I'm sorry, is, uh, uh, if one thing is true in the context of proportions. Um, and that is that we have at least 10 successes and 10 failures, that we are far enough from either 0% or 100% and have a large enough sample that we will get a normally distributed um, p hat distribution um, without being too close to zero or too close to one. So, so if our if the true proportion is really close to zero or one, and our sample isn't very big, that that becomes a problem. So, so if this kind of criteria right here is true, then that means that those those two things together are kind of enough to ensure the normality assumption is probably going to be the case here. So, I'll just say normality. Um, 10 successes, 10 failures. And I we use that term successes and failures not because it's contextually meaningful, but more just like a generic term of, do I have 10 yeses and 10 noes? You could also say that. And the answer here is yes. We have 27 who have the mutation, 142, uh, 100, yeah, 142 who don't. So that is at least 10 of both categories, no problem. What proportion of women in our sample have the BRCA1 gene? So that's going to be that 27 divided by 169. And this is going to come out to be 
0.1598 if I want to round that out pretty far. Usually with your when you're doing um, proportions, since it's always going to be a value below 1, you might, you know, it's probably good to use a couple more decimal places than otherwise. Again, we're just, we would use R normally, so R would be our instrument of precision here. So this is more just kind of good enough work by hand to understand what we're doing and think through the process. If the standard deviation of our sample is 0.366, then what would be the standard error um, for our sampler proportion? So, um, so we're kind of skipping a step here. You might remember in the in chapter six, we talked about how we could derive the standard deviation using the square root of uh, p hat times one minus p hat. So we're just kind of skipping over that step and saying it's going to be 0.366. And therefore, we can just kind of skip over to this step and find the standard error of p hat is going to be 0 0.366 divided by the square root of our sample size, which is going to be 169. So then this is going to come out to be um, 0 0.0282. So this means that we expect our sample proportion to be off by about 2.8%, you know, about 3% here. Um, it could be off by more, it could be off by less, but this is kind of an average amount of error that we should get if we do this process. If we have a sample this size um, that appears to be kind of this unbalanced, this is about how far off from the true proportion we're going to be on average. So that helps us kind of determine um, how wide our confidence interval is going to be. So we're going to use a Z interval. Um, so again, with proportions, we can just use a Z interval. We don't need to bother with a T correction for what we kind of talked about in the last video. Um, so our 95% confidence interval is going to be P hat plus or minus our Z value for 95% times the standard error of P hat. So in this case, it's going to be 0.1598 plus or minus 1.96 if we want 95% confidence, times this 0.0282 value. And so we can subtract this margin of error value. We can add that margin of error value to get um, our, full con our, our interval bound. So again, this is the margin of error over here on the right side. So 0.1598 minus, uh, let's see, 0.1598 minus 1.96 times 0 0.0282, I get 0 0.1045 for my lower bound. For my upper bound, I'm going to get 0 0.2151. All right. And so um, this is my 95% confidence interval interval for the true proportion of women with family histories of breast cancer who would have the BRCA1 mutation uh, based on, again, assuming this is a um, representative sample that is behaving basically like a random sample. Um, if that is true, then, then I'm pretty confident that the true proportion um, in this population is between these two values. Now, if we were reporting our sample proportion to a journal as an estimate for the proportion of women with family histories who had this gene, what would be the margin of error we report? Okay, so again, that's going to be that, that um, other piece there. So I can either calculate that explicitly, 1.96 times 0 0.0282. I could also just subtract off um, my upper bound minus my point estimate, 0 0.1598 if I wanted to. Um, they should come out to the same number and I get 0 0.0553 approximately. So, so then I would say that my point estimate, or we estimate, I'll just kind of frame it more like how we would do it. We estimate that 15.98% have BRCA1 mutation, margin of error 
5.53% for 95% confidence. All right. So, so just kind of turning those into percentages um, and kind of reporting the confidence level that I use to get that margin of error. So, so that's kind of like how much error I'm allowing in my interval estimate if to be 95% confident. If I wanted to be more confident, so this is a good question for you, if I wanted to be 99% confident that my interval contains the true parameter, um, would my margin of error get bigger or smaller? Mm -hmm. You know, it would be bigger. So if I want more confidence, then I need a larger interval. I need to be more sure that I really have it. So I need to cover some more ground if that's the case. All right, in this last question, suppose that we are caring for a woman who does not have a family history of breast cancer. Can we use the, the data above to estimate her risk of breast cancer? Uh, so notice here, for a woman who does not have a family history of breast cancer, that's kind of the key um, information here. Um, since our, um, our confidence interval and our sample in particular is focused on women with a family history, then that means that this person is not kind of in our population of interest. So I actually don't know her risk for the BRCA1 mutation. Uh, uh, or even, so like in the, in the second part as well, can we estimate her risk of breast cancer? That's also like one step farther than what we did. We just looked at the likelihood of having the BRCA1 mutation, which is often linked to breast cancer. Um, so we could also point to that as well, but, but in particular, this woman is really not in the population of interest that we have data on. So really we just can't speak to, um, people outside the population. We sampled from. Now, if this person was in the right population, though, um, I would point out here that we could use this information um, to say that um, the, the likelihood that she has the BRCA1 mutation is probably between about um, 10 and a half and 21 and a half percent. You know, we could say that. Um, so that is one thing that's a little bit different about confidence intervals for proportions is that we can use them to estimate the likelihood of, of this happening for individuals. Um, whereas when we're talking about confidence intervals for means, um, those are numeric measurements. Those aren't, those aren't yes, no questions. They're numeric measurements. And th those are just telling us um, where we believe the mean of a population is, but not necessarily the range in which people's individual measurements are going to be in. Um, but when we're working with proportions, remember this is 0, 1 data. Um, this is a percentage. And so, yeah, we can use our confidence interval inf information to estimate the likelihood of somebody having the condition of interest by nature of the fact that we're just using a different type of data, therefore it kind of behaves differently in interpreting that, if that makes any sense.